you can start when you will want it, Ines. Sure, thanks a lot. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to, to share with you the last day of your school. Uh, I'm sure that you, you enjoy all the lectures. I'm going to give today um, my second one related to the um, accelerator-based neutrino experiments. However, um, you remember that you, you should remember that uh, I'm covering um, the context of the reactor and accelerator neutrino-based uh, experiments. And as I was trying to explain to you the first day yesterday, um, I like this idea of of the two different ways of approaching the reality. I mean, uh, two different ways of seeing and, and, and the three windmills or the giants or more than three, depending on, on what you are looking, how far you are looking at and on wi with which detail you are looking at. So um, yesterday I, I cover, I mean, uh, I made an introduction uh, on the reactor neutrino experiments and we saw um, the advantages uh, of the Sancho Panza approach in the sense that reactors are um, really taking advantage of what is already available and profiting that at maximum. And this is what reactor experiments, uh, reactor neutrino experiments are doing with, uh, with the power plants available. And also uh, going really to the, um, the, the parameter that we need to measure and, and do that as, as, much as, we, uh, as much as we can. So this is a very um, focused approach. So, uh, and, and very, very attached to the reality. While today I would like to, uh, to, to talk about uh, accelerator neutrino experiments, which according to my analogy, uh, they, represent, they are represented by Don Quixote de la Mancha, in the sense that we are going to talk about now about the dreamers, about the, um, about the um, capacity of, of, of humans to, to develop and, and think about machines trying to go far away, trying to explore new regions, try to go um, as, as, uh, as far as possible with this uh, um, idea of exploding the maximum and with, with a vision of, of possibilities, right? Um, I mean, both are, are super important and equally important in, 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 the, in the game because both have, uh, have uh, pros and cons as, as we as we explained yesterday, and, uh, and I'm going to to go. This is the, the summary. I'm not going again through that. It's clear that one approach is uh, is um, simpler, but uh, you should not overestimate that because we saw also uh, already yesterday the anomalies, the things that are still not clear on the reactor side, and we will see uh, uh, the accelerators. Um, the complexity also uh, makes things. Um, uh, more mm, more difficult to uh, to go to the point and an accelerator needs some measurement from reactors to go and, and far away and, and give more precise measurements. Okay, since today um, um, I'm going to to talk about the accelerator based neutrino experiments. I would like to know because yesterday I asked you um, how many students were uh, working on, on um, reactor, accelerator, other experiments or theory. But today, because we are going to talk about the accelerator and neutrino experiment, I would like you please to flash out on the chat uh, in which experiments, accelerator, uh, neutrino experiments are you working in? Could you please write the name of your experiment in chat? I see Francesco working in Icarus Dune, Paul SND at LHC, Elizabeth Dune, Matteo Dune Icarus, um, Sergio Antares KM3 net accelerator from the from the atmosphere. Uh, Rodrigo is being Dune. <coughs> Okay, see, I see. 
I don't see any any anymore. So I don't see anybody from Reality 2K or Nova, which are the current uh, ones. But okay, fine. So I think uh, my my lecture can be interesting for. Uh, no, no problem, Sergio. You are very welcome. And Tales and Kayem 3 net uh, I think they are covered in other lectures. Um, so um, my plan is uh, I'm going to explain a bit uh, uh, how we make neutrino beams. Um, I will review a bit uh, how neutrino oscillations are measured in the context of the long baseline neutrino experiments. Um, how we detect these neutrinos, because um, you will see there are different energies and, 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 and different interactions and how we reconstruct them. And also the technologies of the of the detectors in the accelerator over experiments are, are different. And the main results of the current uh, of the current long baseline neutrino experiments are going to look at the, the prospects. Okay, very good. So, so let me start by um, by mentioning, I mean, the same, at the same, I mean, yesterday I mentioned the discovery of neutrinos uh, with reactor uh, experiments, but today I cannot start without mentioning that the muon neutrinos and the tau neutrinos were discovered in accelerator experiments. And, uh, and that's the, the work of these three guys, Nobel Prize in physics in 1988. Um, in the, um, let's go back in the history. I mean, in 1936, uh, Anderson discovered the, the, the muon in, in cosmic rays. And uh, in 1940, the muon neutrino was postulated and, and finally was discovered in, in 1962 in Brookhaven by Lederman, Schwartz, and Steinberg. Um, the prize was awarded for the neutrino beam method and the demonstration of the double structure of the leptons through the discovery of the muon neutrino. So it has been really the, the first experiment of the neutrinos from a beam, because they develop a new type of accelerator, the alternated gradient synchrotron, that was uh, at, the, at the time the most powerful accelerator in, in the world. So the experiment used a beam of uh, very energetic uh, neutrinos Produce uh, of a shower of, um, sorry, uh, a, a very energetic uh, beam of protons coming from a, from accelerator, and the protons produce a shower of of, of pi emissions. Uh, they travel around 21 meters toward a five kiloton steel wall made of, of, of plates, and and on the way the pions. Um, um, the pions decayed into muons and neutrinos, but only um, really the, the neutrinos could pass through the wall and arrive to the um, neon field detector called the uh, spark chamber. And the impact of the neutrinos on the aluminum blades produce uh, muon spark trails, and, and this could be detected and, and photographed, uh, proving really the existence of, of the muon neutrinos. And um, <clears throat> later on in, in the year 2000, and the third type of neutrino, um, the tau neutrino, was discovered at Fermilab using a special detector uh, called uh, Donut that was able to detect really the, the, the very complicated signature of the tau lepton that was produced in the interaction of the tau neutrinos with nuclear uh, emulsions. Um, this was the, the, the discovery of, of the third neutrino and uh, it was uh, produced um, um, the neutrinos were produced via the decay of, of charm mesons. So as you see, uh, accelerator uh, experiments have been uh, on the basis of the neutrino physics from the beginning, uh, and, uh, and the discovery of this, uh, for the second and the third type uh, was done thanks to the, to the accelerators. Another very important discovery that happened this time at CERN related to um, neutrino beams um, was um, the discovery of the weak uh, neutral currents. So 40 years ago, physicists uh, really working on at the Gargamel bubble chamber. I don't know uh, if you visited CERN, you have uh, for sure um, um, look at this uh, at this chamber. 
um, they presented the first direct evidence of the weak neutral current. Uh, and this was very important because um, this led to the discovery later on of the W and, and Z bosons. And this chamber was designed to detect neutrinos. And it was a small chamber, 4.8 meters long and 2 meters in diameter, uh, 1,000 tons, with, uh, filled with heavy liquid phenol. And the, the, this discovery um, involved two types of events. Uh, uh, first one was the leptonic neutral current, which is the interaction of a neutrino with an electron. And, uh, and then uh, the hadronic neutral currents, the neutrino scattering uh, from, from a, a hadron. So as you see in the picture, uh, at CERN, they provided a, a, an incoming neutrino. Uh, which knocks to an electron in that case and, and, and produces the, the electron being forward and, and this creates a, a characteristic electron, electronic shower uh, with electron and positron bursts. And this is the picture of, of the event that, the, that they provided. Actually, um, um, they had uh, one electron event and, and 166 hadronic events uh, at CERN. But as I said, um, the discovery of this weak neutral current was a, a very significant step towards the unification of the electromagnetism and the weak force into the electroweak force. And, and, and the result really led later on the discovery of W, w and Z bosons that was also awarded with the Nobel Prize. So again, this is another example, an important one of the use of the neutrino beams for um, discovery of of many important things, the neutrinos and the neutral currents. Okay, so let's go to the basics. Uh, uh, simplifying everything in this uh, cartoon that I took from Kajetan. Um, neutrinos for the, from accelerators are, um, in order to see um, the oscillations of these neutrinos, what do you need? You need the beam, uh, the beam, uh, uh, which comes uh, that I will describe uh, later. I will describe every piece of this uh, sketch. Um, we need the beam, and uh, we need to know uh, the flux and, and the, the energy spectrum of these uh, the neutrinos that are produced. We need to know. I mean, we need to oscillate. We need to lead the, the neutrinos to oscillate, of course, and then we need to detect them. And detection implies the knowledge of the interactions the knowledge of the detector efficiencies. And that's very important in order to extract the information on the, on the oscillations. So I will, I will go through these, um, through these uh, steps. And uh, I will start with the neutrino beam, how we make, how to make a neutrino beam. So basic idea, I'm, I'm sure that uh, everyone knows that is, uh, the neutrinos are produced from proton proton beams, uh, collisions, collisions with a target, and the target uh, uh, produces pions and kaons, and then you focus the pions and kaons, charged particles, and then you, you leave them decay, and they give you muons, electrons, and, and neutrinos. And you try to absorb as much as possible muons and electrons and stop them, and just the survival particles are just uh, uh, neutrinos. And essentially, in the beams, uh, um, in these conventional beams, let's say, uh, you may end up with um, 98, 99% 90, of mu neutrinos and around 1%, 2% of electron uh, neutrinos. So, um, as I said, um, we need to start with a beam of, of protons. This comes from um, accelerator complex in the different labs uh, at CERN. Or in this case, this is an example of the NUMI beam uh, formula. It comes from the main injector. So you have uh, protons that um, uh, hit your, your target. And the target, uh, well, the beam intensity is related to, in uh, accelerator experiments, we call uh, accelerators in general, we call it protons on target. We are, um, the, the number of protons on target is giving us the, the beam intensity and, and, and it's proportional at the end of the number of neutrinos which is available. So it's a measure of the statistics available 
at the experiment. And um, let me go, um, let me show you one picture of, of the number of protons on target uh, accumulated in a G2K experiment. So this is an example from the Trino 2020. So uh, you can see here, um, the uh, dots are the uh, beam power, the measure of the beam power that they have been trying to improve. Now they are operating at uh, 500 kilowatts uh, power uh, in a stable operation. But in the lines, you can see um, how the statistics is, is increasing uh, with, the, with the timing. And as I said, accumulated uh, uh, protons on target represents the data that is being provided to the experiment. And then and in, in red, for example, you see um, how many uh, neutrino mode data has been delivered to the experiment. And in um, dark, you see the anti-neutrino mode. And in blue, this is the total accumulated proton and target 436. Um, in the, for example, in the, in the T2K experiment at this point in the in the 2020. So that's a way of seeing um, the statistics that is being accumulated. And you will you will hear about the POT because this is very, very common in, in, in accelerator physics. Um, as I said, we need to uh, hit the protons to a target. Um, usually we use targets of low Z uh, in order to uh, let the protons interact without losing too much energy. And usually we use uh, graphite or beryllium. And then um, you um, produce, as I said, um, pions and kaons. And there is a, a very important element after the target, which are the horns. And the horns are really um, just uh, a series of, of um, magnetic devices, a system that can be designed, of course. Um, actually, neutrino horns were invented at, at CERN, but the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, Simon van der Meer, in 1961, and they have been using uh, uh, since then in many different experiments. But really, the horn is a, is a very important element on the neutrino beam because without the the horn, an experiment would lose uh, around 95% of the neutrinos in its beam because it's really helping to focus focus the secondary charge mesons, um, and 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 I mean you can design the horns of course, um, uh, depending on which particle you want to you want to produce and these are the key elements to select uh, a neutrino or an anti-neutrino beam because changing um, the uh, direction of the, of the magnetic field or the uh, the current you can choose if you want to focus positive or negative charge particles and that's important because of the uh, following decay processes, you can select muon neutrinos or you can select um, muon anti-neutrinos. So that's a, a very important um, element. Um, okay, once you have focused the, um, the, the, the mesons, you need to leave them decay. And that's the main processes of, of uh, you leave them decay in a dedicated volume downstream of the target. And, and these are the reactions, pions decay to neon, pi, pi plus decay to neon plus and, and a, a neon neutrino. And the uh, neon plus decay into positron, electron neutrino, neon anti-neutrino. And K plus also produces neon neutrinos and then the decay uh, produces also electron anti neutrinos so from the decay you see from the decay of the mesons that we are ending up with a mostly and dominating neon neutrino beam however i mean with the, if you look at the corresponding ratio you will see 
that there is also a contamination of other flavors in your bean. And that's a problem because they will represent backgrounds in the in the physics that you are looking for. Because uh, you would ideally would like to have a pure neonutrient bean, but you need to control these other flavors. Because first, you would like a certain contribution of, of what we call wrong sign neutrinos. If we are looking at neutrinos, there will be the muon antineutrinos, and we are looking at them, and we are producing muon uh, antineutrinos, there will be the muon neutrinos. And this may mimic your signal when interacting in the detector, and this could represent a background. But really, the, the complicated and the, and the um, especially if you are looking at uh, electron appearance from a muon neutrino beam, having these guys already on your beam from the beginning, this will be an irreducible, irreducible uh, contamination in your beam that um, affects, of course, your efficiency and your um, capability to, uh, to, to, to um, observe electron neutrino appearance uh, at, at your detector. Um, okay, I hope that this is, we, we will come back to, to this point. Let me just mention that, um, of course, uh, you have seen here, you will have neutrinos, but you will also have other particles, electron and muons, and muons are very penetrating particles. So you need to um, absorb them and stop them. And that's why um, after the decay pipe, we usually um, um, placed um, other structures, uh, aluminum, steel, concrete structures, to absorb the, re the residual beam. And also, we, we used, uh, as, as, as I mentioned, even though neons are very penetrating, so we need to use rock in order to shield them and, 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 and stop them and to really have at the end uh, the, the pure uh, neutrino beam. And of course, uh, there is a complex extract a structure, so be, because we need to, to install different instrumentation along the beam line in order to monitor um, uh, as much as possible every, every step. And uh, usually we install proton beam uh, um, monitors in the target, in the, uh, and also hadron and muon monitors at different stages. And this is being used by the neutrino experiments to um, predict uh, and, 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 and perform measurements of the uh, beam that is being, the, the neutrino beam that is being delivered. So essentially, in basics, um, this um, this kind of neutrino beams, uh, if we compare with the reactors where the flux uh, comes from from the fission fragments and there is pure electron antineutrinos, but uh, uh, as, I, as I said yesterday, it's very complicated to predict the, this because there are many nuclear um, in processes involved. And in here, uh, we have the advantage that we can we can really tune out the energy of the neutrinos that we want to produce, and we do that uh, with the proper design of the of the beam. Uh, you taking advantage of the primary proton beam, uh, we can change the geometry of the target. We can change the geometry of the horns, the horn current, and that's all that give give us the possibility to to really tune in a certain range, of course, the energy of the neutrinos. That's also how uh, this, uh, uh, this um, system also uh, allow us to really produce neutrinos or anti-neutrinos. And this is something that we can choose. In the case of the reactors or other sources, you cannot choose. And then um, also um, we produce um, 99%, let's say, pure uh, muon neutrino uh, 
team. However, as I said, we have uh, a certain, uh, certain contaminations or other flavors that can, of course, impact our final uh, sensitivities. Um, let me say that this is uh, the typical and conventional neutrino beam, but other technologies uh, were proposed and uh, were extensively studied and uh, mainly at the moment when we thought that theta-1-3 could be really very, very small and even zero. So, and there were many efforts trying to um, um, to go beyond the possibilities of the conventional beams. After the uh, precise measurement in the, of the theta-1-3 and seeing that the angle was small, but not so, so small, um, the strategy was to go with the conventional beams, but trying to improve the power of the beams and do them more intense instead of uh, trying other technologies. However, I mean, R&D is still ongoing. And these are, I'm not going to talk about them, but uh, the immune factories, uh, beta beams, and also the decay apex beams, you know, that have other advantages, but the current strategy is act in the current and the, and the next step strategy is to continue with the conventional beams. Um, related to that, um, let me say that um, uh, I'm going to talk about the off-axis technique. I mean, you can, of course, when you have your beam, place your detector just on, on axis or as it is being done currently by the two main long baseline uh, neutrino experiments, T2K and NOAA, to place your detector off axis. And uh, because the technique that I just explained corresponds to what we call a wide band, wide band neutrino beam. So a beam, you know, if you put your detector on axis, that's the um, spectrum of the neutrinos that you may uh, have on your detector, right? It's a, wide band beam right, with a, a, a range of, of energies. But this may not be ideal depending on what is your goal, what is the, what is the strategy of your uh, of the physics that you would like to do. Um, and these two experiments, T2K and, and NOVA, um, they uh, decided to try to reduce the high energy component of the beam because it, it has certain backgrounds that you can avoid, and try to do the beam um, uh, more thinner, in the sense that more peaked, at the point where you would like to maximize, for example, in this case, here you see the um, muon to, to muon probability, oscillation probability, as you see, that you can tune the energy of your beam of your neutrino beam, just placing the detector a bit of off axis with respect to the, to the, to the beam. And this gives you, you know, a um, lower energy, but also you are uh, reducing, of course, the number of neutrinos. So you need to, 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 to find the balance. And this can be done because of the two body decay. I mean, there is clearly a correlation between the pi and the neutrino energies and the decay angle. And with this simple um, relation, you can choose, you know, the angle of axis in order to have uh, the, the, the distribution of the, of the energy. As I said, this has pros and cons, and it depends on your strategy, but going off axis we are really reducing the beam energy, but also the spectrum uh, comes uh, sharp, but lower. So that way you, you allow the experiments to pick up the energy for looking for the maximum oscillation signal, for example, and also, as I said, remove the high energy contribution to background, whoever reducing the effect. So you are having less neutrinos. How can you compensate that? Then you need to be, of course, larger detectors 
and also having more powerful beams. So you need to somehow um, recuperate this, uh, the, this loss uh, by increasing the detector or the intensity of the beam. Um, Okay, so that's uh, more or less the technique. And now I wanted to, to show you um, uh, the predicted neutrino fluxes at uh, super K, about T2K is uh, 2.5 degrees of axis. And the, the peak energy has been tuned to 0 0.6 GeV. And that's very convenient, especially for water charring of detectors, which is the case of the, of the super K uh, detector. So here you see the flux as the number of um, neutrinos per centimeter squared per 50 in MeV per 10 to the 21 POT. You already know what is POT. As a function of the energy for the different flavors. This is when I turn my beam on neutrino mode. And this is when I turn my beam on anti-neutrino mode. And you see here, I have a... a uh, dominated mu neutrino beam and, and uh, mu anti neutrino beam with, as I said, contaminations of the other flavors that I need to take into account. Um, this is the case for NOVA, which is um, at 0 0.8 degrees off axis, and that's why the, the peak energy is higher, is 2 GeV. And again, this is convenient for the type of detector. So, you know, that's uh, that's wonderful because you need to think on a balance and, and how do, 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 do you design your whole experiment. You need to um, design the beam uh, in, uh, in agreement with the technology that you plan to use and the physics that you like to, to achieve. And NOVA has a peak energy of 2, 2 GV and that's uh, the contamination of the, of the other plane. And here you see a bit more of detail. So, for example, in the case of the NOVA, in the neutrino mode, 95% are neonutrinos, around 40% are anti-neonutrinos, and 1% are electroneutrinos. Right. And in the case of the anti-neutrino mode, uh, you have 93% uh, anti-neutrinos, 6% of neonutrinos, and around 1% again of the electron. Okay, that's um, that's regarding the beam. What about the oscillations? Let's see now. Uh, I will go quickly uh, through this because I know that in other lectures uh, you, you got many, plenty of details about uh, the oscillation probabilities and the dependency on the different oscillation parameters. But from the experimental point of view, uh, what we are looking uh, I mean, the advantage, of course, of the accelerators, we mentioned yesterday, reactors are disappearance experiments. We can only look at the disappearance of electron neutrinos, electron anti neutrinos produced by reactors. Here, we have a broader um, um, possibilities. So we can look for um, disappearance of neon neutrinos, we can look for uh, tau neutrino appearance, and we can look, of course, to uh, electron neutrino appearance. For the mu neutrino disappearance, we are looking for something like that. If this is the unoscillated spe uh, spectrum of the mu neutrino, we are looking for a suppression. Uh, this it depends on the energy, right? And uh, by looking at that uh, and interpreting that as an oscillation, we can extract uh, the parameters, mainly the theta 2, 3, and delta square uh, 3, 1. Um, if we plot the oscillated with respect to the unoscillated uh, spectrum as a function of the energy, you are looking some, uh, for something like this, like this dip, which is related to the sin, sin square 2 theta 2 3 on the amplitude and on, on, the, on the distance is delta m square, right? That's important because later you will see what the experiments have measured. Also, we would like to see the, the tau appearance because we know that the most important oscillation that is, is happening is the neon neutrino to tau neutrino. This is the, the dominant one. 
However, it's very, super difficult to detect the tau neutrinos, and you need very special detectors. First, to I mean, you need to create the tau, which has a certain energy, and then you need to be able to identify the tau decay. And you will see there is one experiment that already did it. I mean, I, I already mentioned Donut, and I will mention later Opera, who, who um, observed the, the appearance of the, of the tau neutrinos on the muon neutrino. But uh, usually we, we don't use this channel to, to extract oscillation because really the statistics is, is, is very low. And this here comes the, you know, the most complex but most um, rich uh, um, oscillation, which is the new the electron neutrino appearance that has been the revolution in the in the last years, um, and that was um, achieved by accelerator neutrino experiments. As we mentioned yesterday, this oscillation probability depends on many parameters. This is the case for constant. Uh, um, density, you know, these are effects, including effects in, in matter for constant density, and uh, um, depends on many oscillation parameters. And this oscillation probability uh, may be different for neutrinos and anti neutrinos. And it's the same but changing the sign of the A, which is related to the density of, of the matter, effect matter effects, and the delta CP, if you change that. So we have here um, uh, four terms. The first one depends on theta 1, 3. Second one depends on the solar parameters. Third one is, is CP conserving. And, 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 and the last term, violet CP. I mean, if we measure the difference between um, electron appearance in a mu neutrino beam or electron and, um, anti neutrino on a muon anti neutrino beam, if we see this difference, we'll be able to um, to say something about the CP violation and the measurement of the delta CP. However, this is very complicated because, as I said, we want to compare electron neutrino appearance probability in neutrinos and anti neutrinos. But there are many effects that are playing a role here that can, can and can give the um, uh, same results, but for different reasons. So in vacuum and, and with no CP violation, both probabilities, uh, neutrino or anti-neutrino appearance, uh, should be the same. However, CP violation really increases the, pro the oscillation probability for neutrinos and suppresses it for anti-neutrinos, or vice versa. These are the different points in this, uh, in this uh, ellipse. Matter effects also introduce mass hierarchy dependent, uh, depending on the neutrino versus anti-neutrino uh, differences. So this, uh, if we have an inverted hierarchy, you may have this difference, or if you are in the normal uh, ordering, we, we, we are this, uh, uh, this oscillation probabilities. Or in, in this plot, is neutrino and anti-neutrinos, but it's the same. And finally, also the octant the, of the theta to three uh, may also play a role because it, it may enhance both neutrino and anti-neutrino radiation probabilities, and also lower the um, the lower octants really uh, produces suppression of, of both. So we need to be able to distinguish, to make a measurement, and, and to distinguish among all these scenarios. And as much as information we may have from other means, we will reduce this this uh, degree of, of, uh, of the inherences. OK, so essentially how we detect neutrinos, and this is, of course, depending on the distance and on the energy. But once you have, in the, um, once you have selected that from your experiment, how we compute the rate of neutrinos, but this in a very simple way, just to illustrate you, um, the rate of neutrinos, you can compute it with the flux of the neutrinos. Assume that uh, we have a mu neutrino beam. We should know the flux of the mu neutrinos. Uh, we know that the neutrinos oscillate. They oscillate to a, a different flavor, alpha. 
And then at the detector, we need to know the cross section of the new alpha interaction in your detector, taking into account the volume and the target density of, on your detector. And you need also to correct with the um, detection efficiency. So um, we know all these parameters um, in very differently in the sense that uh, we, we know that we have a lot of uncertainties depending on the parameter. And that's why in accelerator-based neutrino experiments, the approach is to use uh, two detectors. Uh, some, some, somehow, I was also explaining that yesterday for the reactor. The first reactor were just uh, one reactor, I mean, one detector. And in order to, to provide a precise measure of theta 1,3, we use the near and the far, right, to cancel and, and try to reduce as much as possible uncertainties. In the case of the accelerator, it's, 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 the, it's the same. We need to use a near detector uh, close to the, to the beam production when neutrinos are, have not oscillated yet, and we use them to predict the far, what we expect at the far detector and also to mitigate the systematics. Because also near detectors are very available and very useful to provide neutrino interaction measurements. And at the far detector, we, we, we measure the, the oscillating neutrinos. And uh, in a very simplistic way, we may um, compute this um, um, oscillation probability just uh, uh, doing the ratio of the events in the far detector with respect to the near and taking into account also the ratio of the fluxes and the corresponding cross sections and detection efficiencies. So you, you can see here that we know um, we would like to have uh, a lot of statistics. Uh, we need to reconstruct very well our events and, uh, and determine very well uh, the energy uh, of, the, of, the, of the events. We would like to have as much as possible a good knowledge of the fluxes. And for that, we use the near to extrapolate uh, to the far. But also, we have our own Monte Carlo calculations, of course. We would like to have, uh, we need to have a good knowledge of the cross sections that are involved. And, we, and, and I know that Luis already um, explained that. In this regime, they are not well known. We have uncertainties of between 10 and 20 percent, and we need, of course, to have a good control and precise knowledge of the, our detection efficiencies. Uh, a bit more on these uh, projections from the near to the far. Uh, take into account that far and near detectors um, are not necessarily exactly the same, are not identical. Um, in the case of NOVA, uh, they are using the same technology. In the same of, in the case of uh, T2K, they are not. They are different technologies, but it's, this is not really a problem. I mean, it's just that you need to take different into account different things in order to extrapolate your measurements of the near detector to the far. So actually, near and far detectors may have different target nuclei, and uh, and use different particle detection techniques. And again, we use the near detector to predict what we expect and to mitigate the, the systematics at the, at the far detector. And this is the example of the NOVA method. We take advantage of the, um, we start from here. So we have our near detector data, and also we have our simulation in, in red. That's, of course, the reconstructed, reconstructed events in the near detector. And then in order to go to the far detector prediction, these uh, reconstructed events should be, um, should be um, translated to the truth energy. And for that, we use this correlation, correlation coming from the, uh, from the Monte Carlo, from the simulation. We convert the measured spectrum to the uh, simulated spectrum with the truth energy. And we also tune our Monte Carlos according to data. Then we need to know what is the near far ratio. That's something that we know. And we know also the oscillation, we need the oscillation effects. And then we predict 
what is the uh, truth energy at the far detector, which is this uh, distribution. And then using, again, our correlations between the reconstruction and the uh, truth energy, we may end up with the prediction, data-driven prediction in blue, of, of the neutrinos uh, that we expect at the far detector. So starting from the near detector and following this change, we end up with a prediction at the far detector. Of course, we need to take into account the distance and the different volumes, the different techniques, and so on. And that's, uh, that's a table just to illustrate you that this has been crucial for the accelerator experiment. This is the case, an example for the T2K uncertainties. So really, we um, end up with an important reduction of the systematic uncertainties for example, from 12 to 5% on the predicted neutrino events, um, thanks to this inclusion of the near detector information. And um, so this is something that is being used in order to produce basic, uh, precise measurements. OK, how we detect events? I have to speed up because I'm going to too many details. So we are talking about neutrinos at the GEV range. And I'm going to go really quick to this part because I know that Luis already mentioned that there are main, maybe three charge carbon reactions, quasi elastic interactions, where um, the final state nucleon is ejected from the nucleus as a proton or a neutron. We have the resonant single pion production, where this muon uh, uh, plus uh, um, nucleon and pion and the deep inelastic scattering where the neutrino interacts with a quark inside the nucleus. So the way and the important way to detect these uh, this, um, interactions is to look for the for the muon and the rest of secondary particles. And that's uh, the way that I know that Luis doesn't like to, to show the cross sections. Uh, but it's very illustrative for us because we see the importance of the different um, um, reactions at the different energy ranges, and you know, depending on the on the on the neutrinos, T2K is um, mostly uh, below one GeV. Remember, it was 0 0.8, while Nova, for example, is at around two. You will have different contributions from this uh, from this uh, interaction. So, we need more experimental data on this on this regime. Uh, this is a very difficult um, theoretical calculation. Uh, the precisions are still on the order of 20%. Even the antineutrino cross sections are less known, and uh, and this is one of the of the main uncertainties that we have right now on the calculations. These are the the main three. I mean, trying to simplify that, these are the main three topologies that we are looking at in our detectors. A charge current quasi elastic, where you you will, will you will be looking for a muon track with some typically some proton. If you are looking for muon neutrino signals, if you are looking for electron neutrino signals, you will you, you need to to identify electron showers, electromagnetic showers, plus other uh, protons or, or other stuff there. And essentially, what are your backgrounds? The backgrounds are the muon electron contamination in the beam, which will produce this kind of signals, the same as the signal that you are looking for in Europeans, and uh, other backgrounds coming from essentially neutral currents, like pi zero productions that will give you photons that may be very similar to the electron showers. And you need to distinguish between uh, um, photons and, and electrons in order to uh, to distinguish signal and background. What about the technologies of the detectors you've been using accelerators? There are, well, in the reactor case, there were, you know, kind of uh, basically liquid scintillators. In this case, we have a, a variety of, of, of technologies. Uh, we have tracking something calorimeters like MINOS or NOVA, as you can see here in the picture. Um, these are very good for um, around GED energies. They provide 3D tracking and calorimetry, as, uh, as I will show you later. They are essentially iron scintillator calorimeters or liquid scintillator in tubes, uh, you know, with segmented information. 
and they provide very good time resolution and spatial resolution, which is very important in order to distinguish and, and, and to do particle ID. Of course, we have water Cherenkov with the advantage of, of, of construct them and build them in really large volumes. And this is ultra pure water. Uh, however, the, the, um, the events are Cherenkov ring, uh, Cherenkov rings, and these, of course, have uh, their own limitations. Um, but they have been uh, extremely successful on on all these channels. And uh, we also have a new generation of accelerator neutrino experiments now based on uh, liquid argon TPCs. And that's the case of, um, and most of our students uh, are working on that part because this is what is being developed right now. And as, uh, for example, Icarus, as you can see here a picture, um, when they were refurbishing that. And these typically, these liquid argon TPCs provide excellent 3D imaging, particle identification, and calorimetry, and they also have excellent spatial resolution. And uh, we also have near detectors that usually they're hybrid detectors. Uh, in, in the case of Dune, um, uh, we have uh, liquid argon, gas argon, and neon uh, spectrometers, and, and in the case of the T2K, there is also a, 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 a series of uh, a drift chambers, electromagnetic calorimeters, hadronic calorimeters, moon chambers as well. And in the case of uh, the tau appearance uh, experiments, like OPERA, because we need the extremely good spatial resolution, we need to go for a very specific uh, emulsions. And uh, okay, let me uh, show you some events in the in these different detectors. So this is a novel neutrino event. However, complicated to distinguish this event. The problem of NOVA is that is uh, at surface, and being at surface, you are completely overwhelmed with this. Uh, um, cosmic neutrino interactions that are somehow hiding your your interaction. But I mean, is, uh, is, uh, I mean, if at LHC they can do it with the amount of overlap that, that, uh, that they have on from the beam, we can do this also perfectly well. And we can clean all these cosmic neurons and just look at the, at the neutrino event uh, and this is extremely nice to see the um, the muon tracks uh, and, the, and the shower here, hadronic shower uh, from a muon coming from the beam. Of course, you have also the timing of the beam in order to take advantage of when the event happened. Um, okay, that was um, tracking calorimeters, and this is uh, a typical neutrino event from water Cherenkov. I mean, clearly it's um, a different way, again, of looking at neutrinos, but um, this is a very mature technology in the sense they have uh, very optimized the way of distinguishing essentially muon, muon neutrinos than electron neutrinos. Uh, every point corresponds to one photomultiplier inside the the volume, and um, similarly, that the way that it has been done for the for the liquid scintillator detectors, I mean, you can reconstruct uh, the, the particle by adding the information of all these phototubes, and in color, you can see the time arrival of the light for for the phototubes. Early times are blue, red dots correspond to late time, and these are the typical current frames that I'm sure that you are familiar with in order to distinguish on, on, on the events. That's also the super nice um, way of looking at neutrinos from beams uh, in the case of liquid argon TPCs. And here you see a neutrino interacting with an argon producing a muon, nice, super nice and, and defined track 
and the protons, which correspond to the harmonic part. And this is the case for argon neutron, for example, and, and, and neutrino uh, interacting with a neutron, producing the, again the neon and the proton. But also we have very nice electronic um, electromagnetic showers, and and you know the level of uh, detail and the, and the spatial resolution is, is it's really helping to distinguish and identify the different particles. And that's, for example, a typical interaction of a neutrino in the T2 Kenya detector. Uh, these are TPCs full of gas that, has, that is ionized when particles pass through and, and they drift to, I mean, the, the emission electrons drift towards the sensitive readout modules and we record the path of the charged particles and the curvature because they, they use magnetic field. Uh, with the with um, curvature, we can determine, of course, the charge and the momentum and the amount of ionization that determines the, the, the particle type. Okay. That's the way that we see the events in our detectors, but of course now we can, and then we try to reconstruct the events. And for that, we just to, uh, we need to extract the maximum from, from our technologies. That's the case uh, for, for example, this is uh, for NOVA, where we see, we try to distinguish three, these three kind of events, char current uh, neon neutrinos, where we are looking for a clear neon track, char current electron neutrinos, where we are looking the shower, for the shower, and neutral current, which is a more diffuse uh, event. So I we try to identify the flavor. Now, very sophisticated techniques are now in place with um, um, convolution and neural networks that are used usually to identify and classify these topologies. We are looking for contained events in order to, to well reconstruct the particles. We need to, re to reject the cosmic muons. And, um, and for example, in the case of the NOVA, um, they, they, it works quite well. They have around 90% efficiency for this type of events, 80% for this type of events, with a 90% background rejection or 80% background rejection. And uh, once you have reconstructed, this is the kind of uh, spectrum that you got. That you got. This is for the mu neutrino in the near detector of NOVA, for example. You reconstruct the mu neutrino events. The bound, the bound around the Monte Carlo shows the, the large impact of the flux and cross sections and uncertainties because this is the, um, in the case of the, uh, you see the, the prediction that we, that, we, that we may have on the, on the mu neutrino spectrum at the near detector. And, um, and here you see the, um, and of course, uh, dots are the, are the data in the near detector, and the same for the electron uh, neutrinos. And these are the reconstructed, the reconstructed uh, electron neutrino-like events. And we use those neutrinos to predict the background for the new E appearance at the far detector, as I explained before. And here you see that uh, while here we have a, a small contamination of backgrounds for the wrong sign muons, and here it's more complicated since we have also uh, muon neutrino char currents that look like electron neutrinos in some cases and the neutral currents. So you see that we have, and also of course the statistics is, is, uh, is lower. And these are um, the projections to the far detector, uh, Monte Carlo, and actually the data, uh, including in this case oscillations that we will see later. Final word on the systematic uncertainties. This is just an example. The current experiments are still dominated by the statistic, uh, statistical uncertainty. I mean, more data is needed in order to reduce the precision of the measurement of the theta 2, 3 and delta square, for example. This is an example. But uh, this is just to show you the importance of the other parts of the systematic uncertainties that in this case, uh, um, this is largely dominated by the um, detector energy scale, how well we know the energy in our detector. The detector calibration is for now the largest systematic uncertainty. And as I said, both experiments are still uh, dominated by statistical uncertainty, so this is something that is going to improve uh, in the next years. 
With all this information, usually we try to perform simultaneous feed of all samples in order to extract the maximum from all the, all the different samples. And now, nowadays, accelerator experiments are taking advantage again on the precise measurement of theta 13 from reactor experiments, since it really helped them to um, determine it very much precision of the oscillation, delta CP, and the, the rest of the parameters that are, that are not really accessible, accessible for reactor experiments. Okay, I, I'm going to stop for one minute here. In the meantime, I'm going to share the other part of the of the um, presentation because I, I had to divide it in twice. I don't know if there are questions at this point. Or comments? Please? Well, I, I mean, the chair is Marian. <laughs> Marian. Yes, yes, please. You can uh, unmute yourself. Okay, I, I have a question for the uncertainty breakdown. I was wondering how these values are to be understood, because some of them were negative, and I don't really understand how, yeah, what to get from this. Ah, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. I will come back to this. I mean, uncertainties are not negative in the sense that, well, let me just go back. I was trying to switch. Uh, let me go back to here, sure, it was one of the last slides. Yeah, that's the uncertainty, you can see now. Yeah, that's an, this, this is the, ma, the plus minus uh, uncertainty with respect to the value of theta uh, to three, or the plus minus uncertainty in the value of um, delta squared. So, you compute your uncertainties on the different parameters, and then here you are, they are evaluating the impact of these uncertainties on the uncertainty in this parameter. So it's a, I'm not showing every every single step. I'm sorry. This is the uncertainty of the the, the components um, of the different uncertainties in the estimation the measurement of this parameter. That's why you see positive and negative. It's the same way that you say the value uh, of this parameter is this plus minus a certain uncertainty, right? So uh, on this um, on this um, parameter, this is the uh, the different contributions, if you want. And we will uh, talk more about that in for the specific case of, of now. I know I, I'm not sure if um, if I answer your question. Yes, I, I think so. So just to be sure, so for example, you have some range um, of values for your detector calibration, and then you do your analysis um, for different ways to calibrate the detector, and you get different values of uh, sine square theta two three, and this is the range, sort of what you get. Yeah, okay. you you compute your your uncertainties related to the, the um, uh, calibration. I mean, how how would you are computing the energy, for example, with with uh, which uncertainty you are, and then this is a way of representing what is the impact of this uncertainty on your final measurement. And they have been evaluated that in that way. Is in order to know when you show the errors on the parameters which part comes from the statistics and which part comes from systematic uncertainties and inside the systematic uncertainties this is the breakdown of the different components just to understand that what is the impact of the beam flux the reconstruction the detector response and, you know the different parts um, there is a careful study of the different uncertainties to evaluate what we put in the error information right Yes, thank you. Thank, thanks to you. I think there are other questions. How detector systematics are estimated? Uh, this is part of the... Uh, and Francesco raised uh, his hand. So oh, maybe you want to talk, to ask Francesco? Yes, thank you. I have a question about uh, how neutral current events, the deficiency of these kind of detectors on neutral current events, for example, uh, Nova. Uh, 
how because it, uh, since neutral current are way harder to detect because you know they don't produce the it's not clear the, the, the there is no flavor in the, the final state so uh, what is the efficiency of uh, these detectors um, let me say that, for example, as I said here, uh, we have a 90% efficiency uh, for um, mu neutrino char currents. I mean, char currents are uh, somehow easy because we have the charge, the charge uh, leptons to identify. And uh, actually, yes, it's complicated to distinguish the, um, the new in the uh, neutral currents. I would say that we have a, a, a large, really large efficiency. Uh, I can't, I cannot tell you a number now, but um, they are. It depends on the technology, of course, because um, it's not the same in Nova and, and, and T2K the way that you distinguish that. And uh, for example, it's one of the things that uh, it's important trying to distinguish uh, gammas from electrons. And that's perhaps a way that uh, liquid argon TPCs may help on that. If uh, they are good in distinguishing those, they could identify clearly uh, charge currents from neutral currents. Um, it's complicated to give you a number because, I mean, um, it depends on many in, on, on many cases. But absolutely, the, the goal here is to go for, for, for the char current uh, with the muon identify and the rest uh, are uh, backgrounds. And then we, what we, what we they, what they did is trying to, um, in the, I think I show a plot on what is the, um, on the Monte Carlo, what is the impact of this kind of, I mean, we simulate neutral currents and we evaluate the impact. Let me see if we, uh, it's later. I will validate the impact of, of these um, kind of interactions in the final sample. Uh, let me show ah, here. You know, we were looking for electron neutrinos here, however, neutral currents, because we are we, we are not able to, with the typical um, um, variables of the energy, the shower of the electrons, the distance, you know, uh, these all the techniques we are not able to distinguish these electrons. I mean, when we simulate neutral currents, we see that many photons are also reconstructed on an electron, and that's why we have this contribution. So we are not looking at, um, um, you know, our goal is to clean this sample from this. I mean, to reject that that contribution, right? So to, in, to improve our uh, purity and efficiency of the electron neutrinos by projecting the neutral currents, uh, not just uh, focusing on the neutral current. We, we would like to get rid of those. However, they are, I mean, by the Monte Carlo, we may estimate uh, this, this contribution. I mean, which is, um, you know, that's why, for example, this gives me uh, another idea to, to explain that. Uh, because of the difficulty of, re of re rejecting these neutral currents, in NOVA they use these two kind of samples, low purity, uh, low particle identification, and high. So they sacrifice bands while trying to reduce as much as possible the contribution of the other backgrounds uh, to enhance the contribution of the electron neutrinos. So there are different strategies. If you want to keep more events, you do that paying for more backgrounds, or if you want to go to high purity electron neutrinos, then you know that you are having, you know, extremely high efficiencies, but you know you are losing also a lot of events. Right. So you need to find a balance in order to decide how to treat these these neutral currents. You can reject as much as possible, but paying for other things. I hope this was more or less clear. And of course, yeah, thank you. No, no, thank you, thank you. That, that's, that's more clear. So in theory, liquid argon TPCs are way better for uh, providing better uh, efficiency on uh, these kind of events, neutral currents. I hope that we they were able to distinguish on, on between uh, photons and electrons. I'm sorry, I think I, I need to continue otherwise. Um, 
let me I would like to finish uh, what, what I wanted to, talk, to tell you today, but of course we come back to, to questions a bit later. Let me go now for the main, I think it will help you also to understand what I was explaining because this was, you know, the general picture of the analysis. And I would like now to show you some results. I hope that you are seeing well my slides. Okay. So, um, this is the past, the present, and the future uh, on the non baseline nutrient experiments. Um, I'm going to briefly mention K2K, Minus, and Opera. And uh, that's the, where the main work on uh, analysis is, is being carried out in, the, in Japan and the US. Unfortunately, Europe is not having neutrino beams, uh, but um, we are, of course, participating in, in these projects. And the future, again, uh, between the US and Japan is uh, June and hybrid. So um, let me mention K2K because this was the first experiment with a neutrino beam at low distances. And they sent a neutrino beam, a neutrino beam from K, uh, Keck to uh, Super K at 250 kilometers distance. And it was a neutrino beam of 1.3 GV, 98% of mu neutrinos. And they were looking for the mu neutrino disappearance. And this is what they had. I mean, they expected. 158.1 events, while they observe 112. So, and, and also dependence with the energy. So the distortion that I was mentioning at the beginning. So, I mean, they um, select this region uh, on the theta delta square um, plane. And, uh, um, you know, the data it was consistent with the super K data. Super K data, I mean, with atmospheric neutrinos was already uh, more, more precise. But however, it was the first demonstration of this uh, uh, disappearance observations in, in long base line. Um, what about MINOS and uh, Fermilab? So uh, MINOS uh, used the main injector um, uh, from uh, from the accelerator complex at, at, at Fermilab. And they placed two detectors, one near the immune production at uh, one um, kilometer from the target, and another one really far away at 735 kilometers at Minnesota from Fermilab, right? And this is a picture of the two detectors. And they were looking for immune disappearance and also electron appearance. Initially, in the first years of the operation, um, the peak of the beam was tuned to around 3 GV, while at the last years of the MINUS operation, what they call MINUS class, they tuned the energy to uh, 7 GV. They were trying to uh, increase a bit the, the energy. And these are the, the final results of MINUS, uh, including also MINUS plus. So these are on the muon neutrino disappearance with these um, uh, precise measurements of the delta m squared, same squared theta to three. And here we see the prediction with no oscillations and what they got from data. And the nice, super nice dip on the ratio of the oscillations to, uh, data with respect to no oscillations that is uh, uh, expected uh, for the disappearance. While in the electron neutrino disappearance, they just um, um, restrict somehow values on this variable, but they, they were not really able to look at the ele electron appearance. But MINUS was a very important step towards the, the actual measurements. What about tau, tau appearance? I was mentioning at the beginning that um, uh, there is a way of to also to observe tau appearance, and that it was done um, with uh, the last uh, neutrino beam in Europe, uh, it was the CNGS beam. Uh, a beam of uh, mu neutrinos was sent from CERN to the um, Grand Sasso laboratory in Italy, 730 kilometers away. And the idea was to uh, use two detectors that were optimized for tau appearance, uh, Opera and Icarus, with different techniques, liquid argon and um, emulsions. They were taking data. And uh, finally, 
Opera provided the, the, the evidence for the um, tau uh, neutrino appearance in the mu neutrino beam. And um, after, I would say, all these years, they detected, uh, as suspected, according to oscillations, 10 tau events. And these represented a 6.1 sigma significance on the tau appearance. And um, of course, the, the results are not competitive for, for providing precise measurement of the situation parameters, but it was also very important in order to observe. And this is an example of a, a, a tau neutrino event detected in opera with emulsion cloud chambers, um, which are, you know, here we have uh, lead together with emulsion layers that are important to really reconstruct at the, at the micron level the different the, the interaction of the particles and the kink, the typical kink of the of the tau particle. Let me go a bit more quick and uh, fast uh, because I'm running uh, out of time. So um, as I said, the current experiments are T2K and, and NOVA. T2K is in Japan. There is a, a long based experiment sending a, a beam of muon neutrinos from J Park to Super K at 295 kilometers away. And the, as I said, T2K or Super K is off axis with respect to the beam axis in order to have a peak at around um, 600 MeV. And NOVA, on the contrary, um, is a, a much longer distance, uh, is placed at 810 kilometers from, Bay, from Fermilab with a, a neutrino beam, which is the most powerful neutrino beam in the world right now, which is the NUMI beam. And uh, both experiments try to measure um, uh, muon neutrino disappearance and, and, and electron neutrino appearance. And here you see the results of the disappearance. And you see here the reconstructed neutrino energy for NOVA, uh, muon neutrino and muon anti-neutrino. Um, and that's the number of events and the, the best fit. Uh, and you see here how, comparing with no oscillations, uh, the distortion of the, of the energy, the deep, and the, and the reduction of the, of the rates. And that's for the case of uh, T2K, where the energies are lower compared to, to NOVA. And uh, you see in red the systematic uncertainty of the measurements, uh, which in red in rate is uh, three four percent depending on the neutrino and anti neutrino modes, and this uh, interpreting this deficit and, and energy distortion of the spectrum in terms of oscillations, we can extract the theta to three and delta square parameters, and this is the latest NOVA results, um, and this is almost later, but not the latest ones. Here, Marian has the latest ones in in her paper. Where you know uh, there is small discrepancy that is completely compatible both results with these uh, values of the atmospheric parameters. The most interesting part uh, was provided by um, NOVA in the, at the latest Neutrino 2020 conference, where they um, presented for the first time the electron neutrino, the electron anti neutrino appearance with more than four, four sigmas on their sample. So they were running for looking for electron appearance, but also electron anti-neutrino appearance. And, uh, and in this case, uh, um, they uh, they predicted with oscillation 33, and they observed 33, and, but really without oscillations, they were expecting 14. So events I'm talking about. So you see, um, we have seen for the first time the, the clear the evidence of the electron anti neutrino appearance in the, in the muon anti neutrino field. And uh, this can be, of course, um, translated to results of different oscillation parameters. And um, the situation, um, these are the analysis, of course, of, of the uh, every experiment independently. And then we have from Marian and other people, the global fit, including you know the full picture. But uh, according to T2K, that's the values that they uh, they have measured. Uh, they have a weak preference for the normal ordering, and 
also the upper theta to three octant. <clears throat> and CP conservation is excluding at two sigma levels. So we are really approaching, you know, the discovery of CP violation in the electronic sector. Whoever these two experiments are, you know, the limit a bit on, on what they can do. That's why we have new projects. And in the case of the NOVA, as I said, they have presented the first evidence of the electronic anti-neutrino appearance in the new anti-neutrino beam. They disfavor the lower octant and at, two, at 1.2 sigma, really not uh, large uh, um, preference. And uh, also the inverted order, the ordering at one sigma. So still the, uh, the preferences are quite low. And also, this is the delta CP versus uh, sin, sin squared theta uh, to three for the normal and inverted ordering. And uh, you see that they exclude some values of delta uh, CP at different um, orderings at uh, more than three sigmas or two sigmas. Uh, still, uh, you know, uh, there are some tension. As I said yesterday, we like the tension because it makes us to, to keep uh, uh, alive um, between the values of delta CP uh, from um, um, NOVA and, and D2K. But as I said, they are still in the preliminary stages and they need to go further with the statistics uh, since they are still, uh, as I said, uh, uh, accumulating um, statistics that they are running and they are taking data. And actually, this is the projection for the two experiments. T2K phase two will continue until 2026. So beyond the initially approved T2K program. Um, the main goal for T2K is to upgrade the, the main ring accelerator because they need to increase the power, especially if they want to go far away with uh, hyper K next, next phase. So in 2022, they will like to arrive to 750 kilowatts power and uh, 2029, 1.3 megawatts. And they are upgrading right now the near detector in order to, um, to improve uh, the knowledge of the, of the beam. And uh, with that, they think that they could reach a three sigma sensitivity to CP violation when they accumulate this amount of protons on target for certain values of, of the delta CP. So again, uh, they're uh, limited. If, if nature is kind to, to them, they could perhaps reach these uh, three sigmas. And NOVA, they plan to run with neutrinos and neutrinos. They expect to run in 2025. This is the evolution of the significance as a function of the year for the mass ordering for delta CP. So if, uh, um, if they have favorable parameters, I mean, uh, they could reach three, five sigma sensitivity to the mass ordering, because you remember that NOVA is more sensitive because uh, it's placed at longer distance and matter effects are uh, more uh, clear for them than in the case of the T2K, while in the CP, they could reach uh, around two sigma. Again, we need to go, we need to, that's very important because this, this gives us a lot of information for next steps. However, um, we need to go far away and, and for the for the next projects. Let me before go into the prospects to mention. I know that uh, Luis already mentioned that, but I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to mention the short baseline neutrino accelerator experiment that are been running uh, are running right now in a Fermilab um, in order to investigate the stellar neutrino oscillations anomalies. Uh, also measure uh, neutrino argon cross sections and interaction models looking for beyond the standard model searches and also helping a lot with R&D for future liquid atom detectors. And since we have students working already on, on them, I would like to mention the SVND near detector, Icarus um, far detector, and Microboon, which is uh, actually has been running for many years. Icarus is being commissioned right now and SVND is under construction. So these experiments are also very interesting and having uh, information soon. About the prospects, let me go fast. These are the goals for the future projects that we have been mentioned many times. Uh, we need, would like to measure the CB violation phase. We need to uh, measure the octant of the theta 1,3. We would like to measure the mass ordering. 
with the future projects, more precise measurements of the oscillation parameters are possible. And also these experiments are underground because we have a rich uh, um, physics program in terms of astrophysical neutrinos, supernova that Irene is mentioning in, in her lectures, also searches for nuclear decay and beyond the standard model searches. Um, there are two approaches, Hyper-K and Dune. The Hyper-K approach in Japan is to minimize the matter effects and measure CP, um, assuming that the mass ordering is known by other means or by themselves with atmospheric neutrinos, and, and then look at the first maximum. And the Dune approach uh, is to measure first and second oscillation maximum and include the CP and, and matter effects and this, this entangled both effects. Um, let me skip that. So Dune will send uh, a mu nu beam, um, uh, will be the most powerful beam, I think. The idea is to, uh, to send a beam of 1.2 megawatts and, and, and upgrade it later 2.4 megawatts and send it from Fermilab to, um, to South Dakota, to the Sanford Underground Research Facility, where four modules of 10 kiloton fiducial uh, volumes each. So a total of 70 kilotons of liquid argon TPC far detectors will be located underground at more than one kilometer deep at the, at the SARF lab uh, uh, at a distance of 1,300 kilometers. And then we will build a near detect, I mean, this is the beam, we will be near detectors to monitor the, um, the beam and to understand the non-oscillated non neutrinos. And we will build um, these four giant uh, liquid argon TPCs uh, at, the, at, at, the, at the long distance with the, with the physics goals that I already mentioned. Um, there are several technologies being investigated for Dune, and they, this is open for um, opportunities to improve the detector and, and, and go ahead um, uh, with more sophisticated technologies that are being uh, investigated right now. And I don't have time to enter into these details. But to go for these giant, giant detectors, in the case of Hyper-K, I mean, they already have uh, Super-K, so multiply the detector by a factor of two is not so complicated. While in the case of the liquid argon technology, which is um, the largest detector, is, I think it's Icarus by now. And so we need to go from this size, which is around 300 tons, to the size of uh, 10 kilotons. And that's why at CERN, there is a dedicated program, a dedicated platform, the neutrino platform at CERN, where these prototypes uh, have been built and there, you know, there are a lot of R&D and technology and these uh, big prototypes are being tested with, um, with charged particles. This is just the pictures inside of the protodunes. Some nice results on protodune data that I don't have time to, to mention. But here you see an electron, and the shower that I was mentioning and the pion candidate. So with uh, the, the uh, wonderful resolution, we can distinguish the different particles. And, and here, for example, we are trying to um, relate it to the question that we were mentioning before, how we distinguish photons from positrons, which is very important in order to resolve the backgrounds. Hyper-K um, is also the, the future project of Walter Cherenkov in Japan. Uh, the baseline is uh, smaller. Uh, it's the same as, as, as it's right now for Super K. So the idea is to multiply by a factor eight uh, Super K. So it's, it's building a huge tank of, of water. And um, they will also have a complex of near detectors and uh, they expect to start operation in 27. And uh, let me go quickly to this. Um, I mean, I would say that the sensitivities to CP in both experiments are quite similar. Depending on the on the values of delta CP, they could go for um, here. And um, we see um, in the colors, it depends on the um, number of years that you are running, that you could go for 70%. Um, you can explore 70% of delta CP space for uh, you sigma or 50 percent and five sigma depending on the, on the number of years and this is quite similar for for hyper k this depends on the mm, mm, normal or inverted ordering 
and that's the sensitivity for the for the octant. Uh, so this is expected significance for the wrong octant detection, and uh, the sensitivity strongly depends on the use of the external theta one three constraint, of course. And this is the uh, what you can do on, on the mass ordering. Really, on two years data, uh, we can they can easily achieve five sigma uh, of the deviation. So let me just in my last minute conclude the lecture. These are the dreams from Don Quixote de la Mancha regarding the accelerators. And let me conclude with some final remarks. I think this is my personal perspective, of course. I think we are living really a very interesting moment in experimental neutrino physics in general, but in particular with reactor and accelerator based neutrino experiments. As I tried to explain to you, uh, we are close in an area of precise measurements in many oscillation parameters, um, in particular from reactor experiment, but also from G2K and NOVA. They are reaching, they are approaching their limit, let's say. Um, but we are just opening right now the, uh, the possibility of, of uh, future projects uh, um, with Juno, for example, in the reactor, with, with Hyper-K and with um, Dune for the accelerators. And in the meantime, we need also to understand some intriguing anomalies. Don't forget that, because this is uh, this may be also interesting in order to, to open the way to other possibilities. Uh, so we are actively working on that. But we need to, and we are open to discoveries, and we are really dreaming of new physics. So a common is that future projects uh, that are being built right now, once they are built, they will be running for more than 20 years. And you will miss the opportunity to really participate in the design and construction of all these uh, experiments. So I think that's the right moment to really uh, get involved in the design and building and the R&D uh, for uh, building the best possible detectors and the best possible neutrino beams to reach the, the unknown physics. I think it's a good opportunity for your possible postdoc postdoctoral positions to uh, not just to be attached to, to data analysis, but also to to participate in this uh, as, a, as experimentalists to participate in this in this uh, nice project. So let me finish with with this quote from Miguel de Cervantes uh, from the Don Quijote de la Mancha. Uh, uh, in Spanish, el que lee mucho y anda mucho, ve mucho y sabe mucho. And in English, he who reads much and travels much, sees and knows a great deal. And I would, I don't pretend to correct Miguel de Cervantes, but I would say, el o la que lee mucho y anda mucho, he or she who reads much and travels much. <laughs> Uh, but I think it's very important, as, as Don Quixote did, uh, he read a lot, but he also uh, traveled a lot. So it's not only to read and, and, and know the theory, but we need to uh, get forward and, and travel and see and experiment in order to, to have the full knowledge. And uh, with that, I finish. Thank you. Okay, Ines, thank you very much for the wonderful uh, lecture and also for this analogy. Very, very interesting. So now, if there are some other some questions, we have some time. So anybody wants to ask a question to Ines? Francesco, yeah. I think you had something. Yeah, but he probably found already. Right, Francesco, okay. I don't know if you want to open the yeah, microphone. Yeah, sorry, no, don't mind, don't bother my question. I just found the answer. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, they, they were asking. Yeah, please, please, please. I, I saw a comment from Sergio Alves. I think he's working on km 3 net Yeah, I know that there is a proposal to use a, a beam uh, pointing to km 3 net I have not mentioned that because I assume that they will mention in other places. But thanks for the comment. 
um, Prodvino to Orca, right? So good luck for that, and uh, we will looking for, forward to, to see that uh, a reality. So as I said, I apologize because I, I cannot really cover everything, but thanks for mentioning this. Okay, so I guess they were already asking questions during the lecture, so probably, uh, I mean, if not, I mean, they, I don't know if, uh, yeah, today is the last day, so there will be no time to go again to the gather town. But I think everything is is uh, is already clear. So then we are going to to do now. The thank you very much, Ines. Yes. So please Ines. stay. Yeah. Yeah. So we will uh, thank you very much for the for.